And this is my pleasure to, to welcome uh, one of uh, my neighbors too, because we are living 20 kilometers, you mentioned 30, so we 20 from Liège and uh, Maastricht. So uh, Dr. Léon Skurgis, which is um, Associate Professor of Biochemistry at the University of Maastricht, and which is also a um, member of the Cardiovascular Research Institute Maastricht, which is a very active institute, definitely. And of course, Dr. Skurgis, which is well known by everybody, has published lots of paper and is a member of lots of uh, uh, association and uh, scientific committees. So he'll be talking about the um, uh, vitamin K-dependent matrix lab protein, a crucial switch to control ectopic mineralizations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, HN. Thank you, uh, IDS and Nato Pharma, for organizing this lunch symposium. And when I started working on vitamin K as a PhD student some 20 years ago, I could not expect that this would be the result 20 years later, having a full lunch symposium here on, on vitamin K and matrix lab protein. Um, so we divided this, this, this lunch symposium in three. Thank you, uh, previous speakers here, uh, for the great introduction in vascular calcification. I will cover the topic of matrix lab protein, and the last speaker, Kate Morange, will talk about the referential effects of vitamin K1, K2, and, and the activation of MGP. So actually, 100 years ago, calcification was regarded as a passive process. And when I started as a PhD student, I went to the Department of Pathology, and I wanted to work on vascular calcification. And the former head of that department said to me, you know, Leon, why work on calcification? It's a passive process. It's always there. And so who wants to work on something passive? And actually, it was Virkov who also stated that calcification was a passive process. However, some 20 years ago, it was a, a first uh, paper on coronary artery calcification that was shown that it is an active process. And actually, what they stated is that there were GLA proteins, so gamma carboxy glutamic acid uh, proteins, so containing this extra negatively charged amino acids, they were involved in the mineralization process. And actually, they stated that the mineralization was an active process involving cells and proteins. And so from that time on, many people started working on calcification. And looking at this audience, I think that is, uh, uh, that is true. <coughs> the one particular protein I work on is matrix glab protein. Uh, matrix glab protein is a vitamin K-dependent protein. It was discovered um, a long time ago by Paul Price, and he purified it from bone. And so for many years, people were thinking matrix glab protein, as the name says it, it is present in bone, and it has something to do with uh, uh, mineralizing bone structure. However, the group of Cosenti, they made and created an MGP knockout mouse to study the function of this protein in bone. And it turned out that these mice were born to term, so they were born normal. However, all died within six to eight weeks after birth. And why was that? When they gave these mice a closer examination, <coughs> they could find massive mineralization in the vasculature, in the large vessels. <coughs> and all these vessels were ruptured, so, and these mice were bleeding to death. So from that time on, everybody knew MGP is an, a very important inhibitor of arterial mineralization. We now know that MGP is a vitamin K-dependent protein. It's relatively small. It's 84 amino acids, about 11 kilodalton, and it has GLA residues for its activity. It also undergoes a second post-transnational modification, and that is the phosphorylation of the therine groups at position 3, 6, and 9 in the protein. However, that precise function is unknown to date. And the cell that produces MGP in the vasculature is the vascular smooth muscle cell. So that is a process that we in Maastricht uh, started to study. And we believe that the whole vascular problem starts with vascular smooth muscle cells. Vascular smooth muscle cells are normally in a contractile phenotype and they support vascular tone. However, upon stress, for example in CKD, they switch phenotype and they can become a kind of synthetic phenotype, a proliferative migratory phenotype. They start degrading elastin, they start depositing collagen, and also we find calcifications. And that happens both in the media layer, but also in the intima layer. And vascular calcification apparently leads to vascular stiffness, and there we have the clinical problem. And of course, calcification is also related to endothelial stress, where monocytes are extravasated into the vessel, and we get a pro-inflammatory phenotype, we get pro-inflammatory macrophages in the in the, in the vessel, and oxidative stress, accelerating the process of phenotypic switching and arterial remodeling. However, vascular smooth muscle cells also produce this MGP, and clearly this MGP is there to inhibit the mineralization. It is loaded into what we call extracellular vesicles, or apoptotic bodies, and also they are then protected if MGP is in the active conformation from mineralization. 
And the beautiness of this protein is, is that we can modulate it. We can modulate the function. What we do in the clinic is we give a vitamin K antagonist. And as the name says it, vitamin K antagonist antagonize the function of vitamin K. And we want to do that for patients that have a hypercoagulant coagulable state. So those people who have a high tendency for thrombosis, we treat with vitamin K antagonist. However, we could not know 50 years ago that also proteins that are synthesized in the vessel and have nothing to do with coagulation are affected. And so if you give vitamin K antagonist to patients or to people, then you see that MGP is in the uncarboxylated inactive state and we support mineralization. On the other hand, if we have sufficient vitamin K, MGP is carboxylated and can halt the progression or the initiation of mineralization. And this became clear first by studies from Paul Price at Scripps University in San Diego. What he did is he fed rats a uh, vitamin K antagonist treatment. And actually, vitamin K antagonists were discovered as, as rat poison. So he started to use it back in, 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 in rodents. And when he gave these, these rats Warfarin, which is a vitamin K antagonist, in combination with vitamin K1 to prevent serious bleedings, he found that within two weeks of treatment, he saw vascular uh, vitamin K deficiency, and he could find deposits of mineralization, which is here in black. So this is a von Cossa staining, and everything which is stained in black is mineralization in the vessel wall. After three weeks, even more mineralization, four weeks, and five weeks. So what he developed is a model by chemical inactivation of matrix GLA protein, MGP, and thereby inducing vascular calcification. I think this was the start that people became interested in vitamin K and MGP and its inhibitory role in mineralization. Paul Price also described that the warfarin induced arterial, arterial calcification and that there was an increased expression of expression of uncarboxylated matrix GLA protein at sites of uh, calcification. Well, during my PhD, uh, my postdoctoral um, period, um, I developed antibodies against MGB because I was very curious about the different conformations of this protein. And we developed antibodies against the uncarboxylated form of MGP, and we stayed human uh, artery specimens for calcification, so we're using a von Cossa, which is the left-hand picture, and for uncarboxylated MGP, which is the right-hand picture. And these are consecutive uh, sections. And what you can clearly see is that the calcification strongly correlates with, with the accumulation of uncarboxylated MGP protein. And actually, the biggest question we have today is, is calcification first, and then there is accumulation of uncarboxylated MGP, or, as I speculate, there is first uncarboxylated MGP, there is a lack of inhibition on mineralization precipitation, and thereby we get mineralization. So, besides medial calcification, and that is a lot studied, uh, especially in relation to MGP, we have also intimal calcification, or a process called atherosclerosis. And this atherosclerosis is a process that starts with uh, endothelial activation. It starts with lipid accumulation, the infiltration of, of monocytes macrophages, the, the migration of uh, medial vascular muscle cells into the intimal uh, space. And then we get fibrosis, we get necrotic core, we get a lot of apoptosis. And finally, we find the calcified plaque. And actually, this is stated as a type 5B plaque. So this would mean that the calcification process is an end result of a process called atherosclerosis. Or with other words to say, calcification is just be being there at the end. And that is something which we questioned. Because recently, and I just state this, this, uh, this paper, is finding calcium in the non-calcified black. What we look at is calcification measured in the clinic using CT, and CT normally measures nowadays, best at a res resolution of 500 micrometers. However, what I call microcalcification are calcification spots between half a micrometer and 15 micrometers. And so we clearly miss them in the clinic, but also often when we do animal uh, experiments. And now we have a new probe called sodium fluoride 18 probe, and that is very good to uh, detect the vulnerable plaque. And what this sodium fluoride 18 measures is small active mineralization spots in the vasculature. And actually, this paper described that the fluoride hotspot, so the active mineralization, was visible in 86% of the patients which had a negative CT scan. So calcification is already there 
long before we visualize it with CT scanning. And so we, this amendable for intervention. So what we did is we went to the Department of Pathology and we asked for human specimens from the carotid arteries. And what we wanted to look at is the mineralization process at very early stages of atherosclerosis. So we pinpointed at stage one, two, three, four. So normally this is not described that there is any calcification present at these early stages of atherosclerosis. <laughs> the second thing we did is we used one section and we div divided that in different areas. We divided that in areas where you had huge atherosclerotic progression, but also limited and maybe even healthy areas in that same vessel. So we had a kind of internal control. And so we connected to the Technical University in Eindhoven, which has a proton microprobe, and they were able to measure and, and, and quantify uh, element analysis. And they were able to quantify phosphorus and calcium. So what we saw is that already at a type 1 plaque, which is more or less a healthy vessel wall, there was already calcium phosphorus in a ratio that is similar to hydroxyapatite. If you look at stage 2 plaque, even more calcium, stage 3 and stage 4. So there was accumulating calcium phosphorus deposition in early atherosclerotic plaques, which you would normally not detect on a CT scan. And so we wanted to correlate that to bone proteins and proteins uh, that inhibit mineralization. And actually, there's only one protein that very strongly correlates, and that is undercarboxylated MGP. This was already correlating at the first stage, so we saw already in a more or less healthy vessel wall that there is uncarboxylated MGP present, which could be in need of vitamin K. And so what we saw is that there is a very strong correlation between uncarboxylated or let's say a vitamin K deficiency in the vessel wall and the accumulation of calcium uh, in the vessel wall. So we believe that treating patients or treating uh, the vasculature with extra vitamin K could hopefully prevent the mineralization. But how to measure vascular health? Because this is something you cannot simply say to a patient, give me a piece of your vessel and I will do an immunohistochemical staining and then I can tell you whether or not you have uh, sufficient vitamin K in your vessels. So a few years ago, we postulated this hypothesis. So we said, okay, if you have a vitamin K sufficiency, there is matrix GLA protein activation in the vessel wall. This matrix GLA protein in the activated form is loaded into extracellular vesicles or apoptotic bodies, and they are then cleared by phagocytosis, or better to say, a process called aphrocytosis. And what we can find back in the circulation is desphosphorylated, we don't know, but the carboxylated matrix GLA protein. On the other hand, if you have a vitamin K insufficiency, either by sustained low vitamin K intake or by oral anticoagulants, the vitamin K antagonist, or maybe by high consumption in the vessel wall of vitamin K, we see that the MGP is also partly in the uncarboxylated uh, form. This uncarboxylated MGP is not able to inhibit the mineralization. We see here that there is less clearance of these, these uh, <laughs> debris, of these nidus for mineralization. And in the bloodstream, we find back the uncarboxylated MGP, and especially the non-phosphorylated uncarboxylated, because we speculated that this form has the lowest negative charge, and so thereby the lowest affinity for mineralization, and that is easiest to set free in the, min in the circulation. So, Creating these antibodies, here we have the structure of MGP. We started creating antibodies again. The N-terminus, where we have the phosphorylation domain. We have here the mid-terminus, here in blue, the glutamate amino acids that can be carboxylated. And we tried to make antibodies again, the C-terminus, and that was not that successful, I can uh, tell you. So we have antibodies against the non-phosphorylated and the non-carboxylated MGP, and we build it a so-called sandwich ELISA. And first we wanted to prove whether or not this could tell us whether there is a vitamin K deficiency in the vasculature. So we treated healthy volunteers with a placebo pill for six months. We treated patients with, uh, or volunteers for six months with a vitamin K2 supplement, or we treated, uh, used um, uh, serum from patients or plasma from patients that were treated with vitamin K antagonist. And what you can clearly see is that there is no difference over time of six months between uh, the baseline and six months of a placebo treatment. 
if we look at the vitamin K2 treated group, here we see uncarboxylated MGP, so pointing towards a vitamin K deficiency in the vessel wall, which could be completely rescued by vitamin K treatment. And here we see a vitamin K antagonist treatment that the baseline was even further increased so that you further induce the vascular vitamin K deficiency. So next we wanted to know, can this assay be applicable to, to patients? So we used controls. These are healthy, normal volunteers. And what you first can see from this picture is that also the healthy population has some kind of a vitamin K deficiency in the vessel wall. So all of us have some 30% of the MGP circulating around in the inactive form. And they, everybody, in my opinion, could or should benefit from vitamin K. Next, we see aortic stenosis patients, so patients that have problems with their cardiovascular system. They have increased levels of this desphosphoruncarboxylated MGP, meaning that the vitamin K deficiency in the vessel wall is even greater. And here we have end-stage renal disease with even higher levels of this desphosphoruncarboxylated MGP. And nowadays, we know that kidney patients have really a vitamin K deficiency. So looking into this aortic stenosis, we uh, connected to the Riggs Hospital in Oslo, and we were uh, able to receive uh, samples from uh, 149 aortic stenosis patients, and we measured DPUC MGP in these, uh, in these patients. And what we saw, if we divided the group into those patients with a low level of DPUC MGP, so a good vitamin K status, or those with a poor vitamin K status, so a high level of DPUC MGP. Actually, the mortality, if you have a poor vitamin K status, was five times higher. And if you then even include those patients on vitamin K antagonist, the mortality rate even went up to ninefold higher. So indicative that if you have a high level of this uncarboxylated inactive protein, that you are not protected against vascular calcification, which eventually lead to a higher mortality rate. And actually, we only have uh, 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 20 minutes here to present our story. There are more and more studies showing that this DP UCMGP assay, it can be used and will be and must be used as a biomarker for cardiovascular disease. So here we have the abnormal status of uh, MGP uh, representative is a mortality risk uh, marker in heart failure. We have DPUC MGP that it is associated with arterial stiffening in an adult population based <laughs> study. We have DPUC MGP which is associated with mortality risk in patients with chronic stable vascular disease. And also DPUC MGP concentration is predict predictive of vitamin K status and is correlated with vascular calcification in hemodialysis patients. This is just a few of them. You can find many more uh, of these studies in the literature, and there should be many more. So why is this important? Why is this marker so important? A few years ago, we did a study because we believed that if you give, give these, these animals, these, these rodents, if you give them vitamin K antagonists, thereby inducing mineralization of the vasculature, can you also inhibit warfarin-induced medial calcification by giving these rats high levels of vitamin K? So what we did is we gave these rats first three, uh, six weeks uh, warfarin plus vitamin K1 to induce mineralization, and then we switched to different diets. So what we can see here is, and this is, was our hypothesis, can we stop or even regress preformed medial arterial calcification? So I guide you through this. So first we use control rats. And if you have control rats on a chow diet, there is no mineralization present whatsoever, even over a 12 weeks period of time. So these rats were at the end of the, of the study some, some 30 weeks, and there was no mineralization present at six weeks, a baseline or 12 weeks. If we gave these rats warfarin, which you see here. Then you see within six weeks of warfarin treatment, the calcification in the arteries was extremely high. It was tenfold higher. And we also see that when you continue for another six weeks the warfarin treatment, there is a kind of linear gradient. So the longer you give the warfarin, and we also showed this in, in patients, we see that the longer you give warfarin treatment to either animals or patients, the more mineralization you find back in your arteries. So then we switched after six weeks of warfarin treatment to low vitamin K. 
and actually this could not be inhibited, uh, could not inhibit the mineralization. Meaning that once you have calcification present in the vasculature, this is the strongest predictor of further calcification growth. And if you have then low vitamin K, it cannot do anything. And then we switched to a high vitamin K uh, treatment diet. And we found that there were, was some 35% reduction in the mineralization as compared to the six weeks time point. We don't have a clue at this moment where this regression comes from, but to the best, we expected that we had a stabilization of uh, the, the mineralization growth. But we clearly see inhibition or less mineralization, attenuation of mineralization after warfarin-induced mineralization. And we, con uh, we, uh, we repeated this study together with the group of uh, Professor Flöge and Aachen in, in DBA2 mice, and we found actually the same, that vitamin K2 could prevent the mineralization induced by warfarin. So where does this come from? We also stained for this matrix GLA protein in the different conformation in the uncarboxylated inactive form or in the carboxylated active form. And what you can clearly see is that in the control diet, most of the MGP is in the active conformation, whereas if you give warfarin treatment to these rats, most of the MGP is here visual, visual, uh, in the, visible in the inactive form, whereas if you give the high vitamin K dose, you find that most of the MGP is back in the carboxylated active uh, conformation of MGP, thereby inhibiting, limiting the further growth and even regression of mineralization in our vessel wall. So using this knowledge, we wanted to translate this um, to the dialysis population. And again, this was a collaborative study together with a group of Professor Flöge. And we used um, uh, 53 CKD 5D patients, which we divided in, in, in three, in three groups. One group received a low dose of vitamin K2, 45 microgram MK7, 135 micrograms of MK7, or 360 micrograms MK7. And we wanted to see whether or not we could improve the vitamin K status in CKD5D patients. So what we saw, first thought is that, saw is that the DPUC MGP, so the inactive form that represents vascular uh, vitamin K deficiency, was extremely high. There's a high vitamin K deficiency in hemodialysis patients as compared to control. And what we could clearly demonstrate it demonstrate is that the higher the dose of MK7, so the higher the dose of vitamin K, the lower the levels of this inactive MGP marker. So we were able to trans-differentiate this inactive form into the active form in CKD5D patients. So within six weeks uh, period of time. If we then stopped the treatment with MK7, we saw that levels of the inactive form of MGP rose again. So you need to give it uh, for a longer period. This was always a kind of, as I call it, a, a homemade assay. And nowadays, IDS uh, took off the glove, took off the glove, and, and uh, translated this this assay into a fully automated, uh, inactive MGP measurement. This DPUC MGP is now or will be available in the next month, from July 2016. It only requires 50 microliters of EDTA or citrated plasma. You will have your results in one hour, and it's fully automated, which reduces uh, variables between labs. And I hope that many people will use this assay so that we get more and more data to prove that DPUC MGP, so the inactive form of MGP, and a vitamin K deficiency is really present in patients that suffer from uh, cardiovascular uh, disease and that we possibly can treat that. We also checked, or IDS checked whether their new automated uh, assay uh, correlates with the old assay as we developed it uh, in the University of Maastricht, and there is a very high correlation. So also new results can be correlated with those results which are already published in the literature. So finalizing and setting the stage for the final speaker is that we have in our vasculature the vascular smooth muscle cell, which is, I think, crucial. It needs to be there to support vascular tone. However, upon stress, for example, in the CKD environment, there is switching of contractile vascular smooth muscle cells to what we call synthetic vascular smooth muscle cells, which are in the presence of high vitamin K be protected because carboxylated MGP inhibits bone morphogenetic proteins type 2 and 4. That has been shown in the literature. 
carboxylated MGP will be loaded in extracellular vesicles and they are then cleared without being calcified in the extracellular matrix. However, if we have low vitamin K status or vitamin K antagonist treatment, we have the vascular smooth muscle cells loaded with uncarboxylated MGP. There is no inhibition of bone morphogenetic proteins type two and four. Uh, yeah, two and four. We get osteogenic differentiation of vascular smooth muscle cells, like Ziad Masi already presented. And then we see that these apoptotic bodies and extracellular vesicles are loaded with the inactive form of MGP and then being prone for mineralization in the extracellular environment. Thank you very much, and I'm more than happy to answer all the questions. <laughs> Yes, please. <laughs> can go to the microphone there. There is one there. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not a nephrologist. I'm a cardiologist. And uh, the first speaker, our friend Ziad, has insisted on a chronic disease and vascular classification. Uh, uh, my question, maybe you can ask the boss question. Second question, why, what, the difference between calcification in chronic disease and a patient without chronic disease. So, second, you showed a good correlation between a low level of vitamin K and uh, uh, UCMGP. Why dosing UCMGP and not dosing vitamin K to see what is the risk of calcification in those patients? So coming back to the first question, I think that the mineralization we find in the vasculature vasculature between uh, cardiovascular patients and CKD patients, it's the same mineralization. The only thing is the CKD patients is accelerated mineralization. It's accelerated aging, and I think they are so prone for mineralization because the calcium and phosphate is extremely high, and, and so there is a higher pressure for, for precipitation. So I think at the end of the day, I think the mineralization is the same, only it's accelerated in CKD patients. Coming back to the second question, very good suggestion, and we are doing at this moment all the trials, giving vitamin K to patients, measuring DPUC MGP, whether we improve that, but also measuring outcome and mineralization as endpoint markers. Didn't include that in my presentation because I think that will be covered in the last presentation. We are, we are not dosing MGP. Vitamin K. Why not, we, we, why not you? Oh, oh well, you, of course you can measure vitamin K in the plasma, but that is very, very um, um, variable because it, it, it fluctuates with the diet you ate the day, the day before. And so vitamin K is, let's say, absorbed, but then it doesn't do anything. You know, it needs to go to the cells to activate these proteins. So actually bioactivity of vitamin K, measuring the proteins that are activated, is much better than, let's say, just simply vitamin K. Yes, microphone number two. We've got only five minutes, so please, short questions and short answers so that everybody can speak. Uh, thank you very much. It will be very quick. Yeah. Here. <laughs> we are having a problem in patients with end-stage renal disease because we are not usually allowed to use the new oral anticoagulants. So in case they are indicated, if they are having AF or something, to use warfarin, what do you suggest that we will do? We are coronary now. And my uh, very uh, small comment is that there is a difference between patients with end-stage renal disease and atherosclerotic patients because it started in the media, not in the intima. So we are having a, uh, um, a little bit of difference. Yeah, so, co so commenting on your last part, we are at this moment investigating it, so the relation between medial and intimal calcification. I hope to present or can present some data next year. Um, coming back to the warfarin-treated patients, we are at this moment investigating whether or not better to switch to the, the, the so-called so NOACs or DOACs, you know, the novel oral anticoagulants or the direct oral anticoagulants, as you want to term them, so dabigatran, rivaroxaban, idoxaban. We have already indications that these are much better, so they have the same effect on the coagulation system without affecting the vasculature. Actually, they are even beneficial because they inhibit also the, the thrombin effects on PAR1, PAR2 signaling, and thereby the switching of vascular smooth muscle cells. So I think in the near future we will learn a lot of these NOACs and stay away from the warfarin. If I, if I can add a comment to that, I will have a lecture on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday morning on NOACs in CKD. The five second version of the lecture is don't use them below a GFR of 30. Yeah. <laughs> and I will tell you why on Tuesday. <laughs> so the invitation in Sloan. 
<laughs> Please, thank you. I've got one short question. Given that vitamin K is necessary for liver and, uh, anti -co and coagulation factors, yeah. and vitamin K1 to K2 conversion is very low, would it make any sense or it is clinically possible to combine an oral anticoagulation will with vitamin K supplementation or doesn't that work for the anticoagulation? Yeah, we, we tried that in healthy volunteers. So I, I was one of them. I took myself a, a vitamin K antagonist, warfarin in this case. And uh, we also supplemented that with vitamin K1 and K2. And actually both forms dysregulate the INR. So I would not give them together. Or you want to create a kind of full price red model in using mineralization in the vessel wall. Yes, please. Could there be an impact of changes in microbiome in patients uh, with a CKD uh, that might affect vitamin K and by that accelerating atherosclerosis? I cannot give you the answer, but I think that the question is brilliant. Yes. One, one question. Have you ever in some of your models seen a reversal of calcification? Because the statement that uh, if it has been mineralization in the blood vessel, it will stay forever. Is that possible to explore? So what, what, we, saw in the, uh, what we saw in the animals, in the rats, we saw re really regression or less mineralization. And at this moment, we are doing a vitamin K2 trial in the Netherlands. It's double-blind placebo control. We have already some patients that completed the two-year study. And what the cardiologist sees is that in some patients, there is regression over two years period of mineralization. This is very unusual. It's wishful thinking in which group you want to put these patients, but we have to, to await the results and, and when, the, the, when the key is opened uh, in, in one or two years. But we see that calcification it is, is not something which is always stable, but can be regressed. So, okay. So I would like to emphasize on, on the point you mentioned, uh, the, the ISIS and the, the DSA will be available in July, but I uh, have a great privilege of having already tested this in, in my lab and also make a complete validation of, of this essay, uh, which gave really excellent results. So I'm pretty sure that uh, this, this test will definitely be used in the, in the next months, of course, once we launch, and it provides great results for, for, for the other studies. That's very good. Thank you. So thank you. So...